Hello everyone, I am Jonathan Little. Hope you're all having a wonderful day. Today, we are going to be discussing 10 tips to master No Limit Hold'em preflop strategy. You may ask, why discuss preflop? Isn't that easy? Well, it turns out it's not. A lot of people mess it up. If you want to crush 1-2 Live No Limit Hold'em or small stakes tournaments, you must play fundamentally sound preflop strategies, or at least be aware of them. If you do not have a solid game plan for preflop play, you are gonna leak money every single time you play because you have to make a decision before the flop every single hand you are dealt in. And I think some people think that if they make slight preflop errors, it's not that big of a deal. And to be fair, it doesn't actually cost you all that much money on each individual hand. But if you consistently make even small errors very frequently, those add up to become very, very big leaks. And if you have very big leaks in your game, you're not going to win, even at the small stakes. In this webinar, you are going to learn solid preflop fundamentals. Also, huge preflop mistakes to avoid and also how to crush limpers. Is this geared to tournaments or cash games? Both. You have to play before the flop in both tournaments and cash games. It is vitally important. I know a lot of people in cash games play loosey-goosey. They're eating sandwiches all the time. And, well, they make blunders left and right. This is why it is possible to have a humongous win rate in small stakes cash games. In tournaments, I do think people typically play a little bit better before the flop, probably because they realize, well, you, you just can't goof off. If you goof off, you're going to lose. Um, that said, if you think you can goof off and be loosey-goosey in cash games and you think you're going to win, you're probably not. There's a reason a lot of players get stuck in the small stakes games forever. It's because they play a lot of trash. Tip number one is to make sure that you think in terms of ranges. It's vitally important that you think in terms of ranges. What is this here? That. Something's wrong with my chat box. There we go. If you do not think in terms of ranges, you are going to consistently make blunders. Instead of trying to put people on a specific hand, you want to make sure that you put them on a range, and then that's going to guide your pre-flop decisions and also your post-flop decisions. For example, here we have a range that the low jack can raise. The low jack would be under the gun, six-handed, 100 big blinds deep. Take a look at this range here. They're raising all suited aces, pocket fives and better, some suited kings, some all the Broadway suited hands, some all suit Broadway hands, 10-9 suited, and that's about it. Now, what a lot of people do wrong is someone raises and then pe people will put them on ace king or put them on king 10 suited or put them on pocket nines. But recognize if your opponent's anywhere near competent, they're going to use the same raise size with every hand they are playing and you have no clue what they're doing. They could have any of these hands. And if you consistently put people on a hand instead of a range, you are going to make all sorts of mistakes. Am I accepting questions today? You can type it in. If it's relevant, I'll answer it. If it's not relevant, probably not. Next, you need to learn how to count combos. What is a combo? It's important to realize that each hand is not equally likely. There are 12 combinations of each offsuit hand. For example, ace, queen, offsuit. There are 12 different ways to make it. Ace of clubs, ace of, ace of clubs, queen of spades, ace of clubs, queen of hearts, ace of clubs, queen of diamonds. Not ace, queen of spades, though, because that's suited. And then you can go through that. You'll see there's 12 combinations. For suited hands, there's four combinations, right? Ace, queen of spades, ace, queen of hearts, diamonds, and clubs. And then for pairs, there are six combinations of each pair, which actually makes pairs kind of unlikely, if you think about it, right? There's 16 combinations of each offsuit hand total. There's six combinations of each pair. Okay? You're not sure if we're talking about cash games or tournaments. Both! The games are the same, especially when you're playing medium or deep stacked. So many people want to get wrapped up in their heads. Oh, I'm playing a tournament. This is very different from a cash game. But the early stage of a tournament is the same as a cash game. Recognize that. We're not talking about preflop adjustments for when there are giant payout implications. That would be a whole nother topic, right? It's very important to understand the format that you are playing. We're discussing regular old no limit Texas variety. Nothing fancy. Okay. So here's a quiz. If you hold an ace in your hand, how many combinations of each of the three hand types does that take away? Look at this sentence. If you only how many? That takes away, yeah, that takes away how many combinations of each of the above hand types. 
Take a second, think about it. If you have an ace in your hand, how many combinations of pocket aces are now available? And how many combinations of ace-king are now available? Well, I'll tell you a little trick. For unpaired hands, you multiply the number of available cards by of, of one card by the number of available cards of the other card. So, if there are normally four aces and four kings, four times four is 16, right? So there are normally 16 combinations of each offsuit hand right here. But if there's one missing, now it is three times four. Three times four is 12. So if there is one ace missing because it's in your hand or because the dealer missed dealt and one of them flipped up, whatever, if there's an ace out of the deck, no matter where it is, then there are only 12 combinations of ace-king. For the pairs, if there is an ace missing, there are now only three combinations of pocket aces. So if you know there's an ace in your hand, it's really unlikely you're going to be against pocket aces. I realize it could happen, but it's not likely at all. Okay? Looks like some of you are thinking that if you have an ace in your hand, it removes half of the combinations of ace-king. But that's definitely not true. It only removes 25% of the combinations of ace-king. Three times four is 12. Okay? All right. Next. Start with GTO ranges. I cannot make this any more clear. Exploits are very important, especially in the small stakes games, but you must start with fundamentally sound game theory optimal preflop ranges. You cannot do things like limp in with the 8-5 suited and claim it's exploitable or exploitative, that you're trying to take advantage of your opponents. If you do that, you are going to lose. This pre-recorded. No. I'm literally standing in my home right now, talking to all of you live. It probably is on like a three second delay because internet, am I right? But look, people in cash games make all sorts of blunders and in tournaments. And the problem a lot of people run into is that they think that their opponents are playing reasonably and then they copy the strategies of their opponents. And that is a mistake. Put a shoe on the head if it's live. I don't have a shoe. I'll put uh, these, these, new, these new headphones. I'll put these new headphones on my head if it's live. There we go. We doing it? So let's take a look at some GTO preflop ranges. Here we have one, two, no limit hold'em cash game ranges in the low jack, under the gun, six-handed. Notice what you should raise. We already showed you this chart. Recognize what you're not playing. You're not playing 8-5 suited, ace-8 offsuit, queen-9 offsuit, jack-4 offsuit, 7-2 offsuit, 10-2 offsuit, jack-3 suited, 6-2 suited. None of these hands are playing. All the hands in blue are folding. And you may say, but my opponents can play those hands. Why can't I? Well, look, you can do whatever you want if you don't care about money. But your opponents are losing if they are playing and stuck in small stakes games. And I don't want you to be stuck in small stakes games. I want you to win. And in order to win at poker, you have to have a little bit of discipline. Okay? Now look, if you wanted to raise a little bit wider than this with stuff like 9, 8, 8, 7, 7, 6, 6, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, etc. If you wanted to raise those hands, I don't think it's that big of a deal and that'll be fine. Especially if, well, ask yourself this first. When would you want to raise wider? When would you want to raise wider in the low jack seat? Well, you would want to raise wider in the low jack seat when the players yet to act are going to be too tight in general and when you're not going to get three bet re-raised very often at all, right? If you can get re-raised a lot, you certainly can't raise wider because you have to fold all the hands that you'd be raising that are on the wider end, right? But if players are going to be a little bit too tight and not three bet quite enough, then you can raise a little bit wider. So maybe all king five suited and better, jack nine suited, queen nine suited, nine eight eight seven seven six six five five four fives fours, maybe threes and twos, all king jack, all ace ten, not that many more offsuit hands. You're going to find that 100 big blinds deep in a cash game, Offsuit hands are bad. They're bad, bad, bad. A lot of people think Queen Jack is amazing and King 10 is amazing. Nope, not at all. Now, from the button, we're raising 40% of hands in a cash game. This may be tighter than a lot of people are used to. But, again, it's what you got to do. A lot of people think that you can raise very, very wide on the button. 60% of hands, 80% of hands. And to be fair, you can raise wider if the blinds are, again, not going to call enough and not going to 3-bet enough. Or call and then play really weakly post-flop. But if they're going to play anywhere near well, you can't get too out of line. Aren't these ranges extremely tight rake-wise? Yes, these charts presume there is a rake. And when there's a rake, you have to be tight. 
As the rake gets bigger, you have to be tighter. This presumes a normal-ish rake. If you're playing a game with a humongous rake, you have to be even tighter than this. If you're playing a game with no rake and an ante in play, like a tournament, then you get to play wider. All right. Next, use sound preflop sizes. You need to stop changing your bet size based on your hand strength. So many players in small stakes games make it bigger with specific hands, like uh, pocket jacks. They'll make it three big blinds with everything except for pocket jacks. And when they have jacks, they make it five big blinds. That used to be something people did all the time in even medium and high stakes tournaments. They were super fish. They got crushed. And, uh, well, you can't be doing that. <clears throat> so, carry of a chart. I'm not going to necessarily read through this whole thing. But essentially, as stacks get shallower, you raise to a smaller amount. This is why you see tournament players very often raising to two big blinds when they have you know, 40 or 60 big blinds, right? You want to be using small preflop raise sizes in general. However, if a bet would put in something like 30-ish percent of your stack or more, you're usually going to want to go all in. All right? Notice here, we have fewer than 12 big blinds that say just to go all in preflop. That is not actually accurate. Uh, there are plenty of spots where you do want to min raise if you want to open, but for simplicity, you can probably just go all in. That said, we have a preflop app on pokercoaching.com and in our, um, in our, on our website, my brain's broke, I'm trying to reach out over here. And uh, you'll, you can find good solid GTO preflop plays for 12 big blinds or shorter, and you should have some min raises. All right. Is this based on the effective stack or the lowest stack in play? It's, well, so look, you have to realize, so what is the effective stack? The effective stack is the stack that you are playing based on the players in the pot. But say you have 100 big blinds and so does everyone else, but one player has 12, you can't just go all in for 100. That'd be ridiculous, right? So you have to adjust to the stacks that are likely to be involved. And yeah, you probably should be using smaller array sizes to like two big blinds, but you shouldn't just be ripping it in for 100, right? Next, number five, three bet with a polarized range from in position. What is a polarized range? A polarized range is comprised of your best hands as well as some hands that are okay, but not quite good enough to call or perhaps barely good enough to call. And then you're going to call with all the stuff in between. For example, here's a reasonable polarized range. Let's say someone raises and you're on the button. You would three bet with something like jacks and better, ace queen suited and better and ace king straight up for value. You're three betting these planning to get all your money in. Next, you're also going to three bet these hands in blue as bluffs slash thinnish value bets. So we see ace nine, king 10, queen jack, offsuit. These are not great hands. They're barely playable. We would be three betting this. Over here, with suited hands, you're going to find that you often like to three bet some suited aces, some suited kings, and some suited connected type hands. And you're going to find before the flop, when you're playing medium or deep stacked, at most you can have something like two preflop quote-unquote bluffs for every one value hand. So you see here, uh, we have 25 to 13. That's about a two to one ratio. You're gonna find that that's usually very good when you are playing medium or deep stacked. Over here for these sizes, can we explain this a little bit? When everyone folds to you, say we have 22 big blinds, you're gonna make it 2.25 big blinds before the flop if everyone folds to you. When there's one limper, you're gonna make it about four big blinds. When there are two limpers, you're going to want to make it a little bit more, like five big blinds. Three limpers, you want to make it something like six. When you're facing a raise, you're going to want to make it 2.7 times the initial raise. So if they make it two big blinds, you'll make it something like 5.5 big blinds in position, something like 6.5 from out of position. If you raise and someone three bets you, you're just going to go all in. Because if you re-raise, let's say you make it two and they make it, or 2.25 and they make it five and a half. If you were to make it, what, 12? you'd have more than 33% of your stack in. And for that reason, you're usually going to want to be all in. All right. Anyway, here we are. Polarized ranges from in position. You're going to find this is very, very standard when you're playing medium or deep stacked. What are the downsides of not bluffing often enough? Well, if you're not bluffing often enough, you'll stop getting value. And also, you're just not playing your range as profitably as possible. You want to play as many hands as profitable in... We want to play as many hands as profitable because every hand you're playing makes money. And that essentially forces you to want to play as wide of ranges as possible. Notice we're calling all these hands in green. All these hands in green really do not want to three bet and then get four bet because if you get four bet, you have to fold or maybe make a rough call like ace jack suited, ace 10 suited, king queen suited. We have to call a four bet, but it's pretty rough. 
Um, so instead, you just opt to call these hands. Next, you're going to three bet with a linear range from the small blind. A linear range is just your straight best hands. And you're going to find that unless you're playing in a tournament with an ante and no rake out of each pot, you really don't get to have much of a calling range at all in the small blind. A lot of people don't like this. They think that they're supposed to call a lot of hands from the small blind because they're getting okay odds. But when there's a player yet to act behind you in the big blind and you're against the initial raiser, you need to be three betting every single hand you are playing. As you see, you're three betting all these hands. All the hands in red. Everything else is folding. You may be shocked to see. King Jack, Ace 10, Queen Jack, offsuit folding. Suited connectors, folding. It's annoying, I know, but when you're against a reasonable, strong, early position raising range, you have to be very strong from, or very, very, very tight from the blinds, especially out of position. Again, we have full charts for all sorts of positions in the poker coaching app. If you three bet with your weak hands and you get four bet, do you fold? Yes, you're bluffing. And when you have the nuts, you don't fold. From the big blind, you're usually going to three bet your absolute best hands, and then mostly hands that have good, strong post-slot playability. And that's going to be hands like suited, connected type stuff. And a few suited aces, a few suited kings. But a lot of people do not three bet these hands like jack-10 suited, 9-8 suited, 6-5 suited, 10-8 suited, etc. They just call all those. And that's a mistake. Also, a lot of people call too wide against raises from the big blind. They think, all right, I'm closing the action. I should call with all sorts of stuff. And you should, but not... 10-4 offsuit and 7-3 offsuit, stuff like that. Those are pretty bad. If you also wanted to call a little bit tighter with these offsuit hands, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Like if you wanted to fold out 4-3, 5-3, 7-5, 10-6, queen-3, queen-4, that's fine. I think it's fine to fold some of the offsuit stuff. But facing a min-raise, you do want to be calling with lots of suited hands, especially in tournaments with no rake. Why ace-4 and not ace-5? Recognize this chart here is what I refer to as an implementable chart. The GTO chart will be using mixed frequencies. It's probably three betting ace five, ace four, ace three, etc. Some small portion of the time. But us humans are pretty bad at doing these plays, let's say 33% of the time each. So instead, find one hand, put them all into one cell, call it a day. And um, typically, whenever you are making implementable strategies, you want to make sure that you are mixing it up. So like right here, notice we have ace four here, and over, eight, over here we have ace five suited. Slightly different, it gives you better board coverage. Board coverage is important because you don't want your opponents to somehow figure out that you only three bet with ace five, and then when the board comes five, five something, then uh, that doesn't work so well for you, right? You want to be able to mix it up. You want them to, to keep your opponents guessing, which is why you three bet with a smattering of stuff, right? So that your opponents don't know that any particular board is especially good or especially bad for you. Tip number eight, crush the limpers. The first step when you're playing against players who limp a lot is to classify each limper as either a straightforward limper or a tricky limper. Some players limp with only hands they think are not quite good enough to raise. For example, a lot of players will raise all these hands here in red, and then they'll limp all the hands in blue, or something like this, to where their limping range is relatively weak. Some players raise almost everything they're going to play except for some absolute trash that they limp in with. And that makes their range especially weak. Okay? Tricky limpers, however, will limp with stuff like aces, kings, queens, and ace, king, as well as some trash, you know, maybe maybe, maybe not with some trash, looking to limp and then re-raise you. If a limper is tricky, you have to be way more cautious raising them, especially for thinnish value, because you don't really want to raise a hand like ace, jack suited, and then get limp re-raised. It's a bit of a disaster. So you might want to limp behind against those players a little bit more often. The way to crush limpers in general, though, is to raise wide for value. And then also limp behind when you're in position on the button with hands that flop well enough. So again, take a look at this chart, right? Against limpers, you may want to raise with all these hands in red, just straight up for value, and limp behind with these hands in blue that flop very, very well. Okay? Who made these implementable charts? Me! Me! You, I, I looked at GTO charts and then combined the cells logically to give you good board coverage to make them implementable. That said, I'm always a fan of learning to play good, strong GTO strategies. If your opponents limp too much and are not raising, how much wider can you raise, or how, how much wider can you raise their limps? Well, it depends on if they're going to call a lot, right? 
if they are limping reasonable hands and they're going to call your raises every time, then, you know, you can't get too incredibly out of line, especially if they play well enough post-flop. Fortunately for you, people who limp pre-flop with a lot of stuff usually don't play very well pre-flop or post-flop, and that leaves them very susceptible to getting crushed. So, I mean, take a look at this range we're raising, though, right? Notice we're raising just a good, strong, linear range of hands that should crush most limpers' ranges. I mean, imagine if your opponent's limping these hands in red. I'm sorry, limping the hands in blue. Raising the hands in red is very, very good. What's the best way to learn post-flop strategies? Check out PokerCoaching.com. We have a cash game and tournament masterclass that teach you everything you need to know to develop good, strong, implementable strategies that will crush your opponents. Tip number nine. Play tighter in multi-way pots. Many players play way too loose in multi-way pots. They think that because they're getting better odds, they can call with all sorts of stuff. But, but, the problem is that you'll have big reverse implied odds, especially when deep stacked. And if you play a lot of wide ranges, you're gonna end up with good but non-nut hands. And as more and more people see the flop, someone's just more and more likely to make the nuts. And when they make the nuts and you make the second nuts or fifth nuts or whatever it is, you're going to get stacked. So you're going to find that you have big reverse implied odds with the junkie hands. And that's going to get put you in a lot of trouble. You cannot be calling raises with stuff like king eight offsuit or queen five suited on the button if someone raises. That is a disaster. I know people do it all the time in small stakes games and they get crushed, all right? You're gonna find that you do have to be quite snug in multi-way pots. On pokercoaching.com and in the app, we actually have multi-way cash game charts. You can extrapolate a little bit for tournaments. We're gonna be adding tournament multi-way charts very soon, so make sure you get in there and check out these ranges because they're probably tighter than you think they are or think they should be, um, especially from the big blind. Uh, you can defend the big blind much wider when you're just against one player. Against multiple players, though, you have to be tighter because, again, you're far more likely to be dominated with all the hands that are junky. Okay? The ability to make the nuts is vitally important. You enjoyed me on the Table One podcast. Yeah, check it out. Google or YouTube. Table One podcast. John Little. They didn't put Jonathan Little. They put John Little. Tip number 10. I'm going to tell you the best tell for preflop play. We discussed this earlier. You make money by playing hands profitably. And there's one tell that lets you play way more hands profitably. And that is to look to the left. For example, say it folds to you in the hijack seat and you can look to the left and tell the cutoff and the button are both folding. Well, now it's like you're on the button. You just got the button for free. And instead of being able to raise with 25-ish percent of hands from the hijack maybe now you can raise 40 or 50 percent of hands from the hijack that lets you play twice as many hands in a profitable manner and that is incredibly valuable when i used to sit and play 5 10 and 10 20 at bellagio every day i would probably have the button i don't know two times per orbit or maybe more because you can find players who you can sit, have them sit seated on your left who will just start folding out of turn not actually out of turn but with their actions right They'll go from like being focused on poker to all of a sudden like, you know, watching TV or chatting with their friend or playing on their phone, whatever. They make it crystal clear if they're playing or not. So you always want to look to the left and ideally find people who have preflop tells that make it clear if they're playing or not on your left. And to be fair, say you're in the cutoff seat and you're about to raise with 30 something percent of hands, but then you can tell the player on the button likes their hand. They go from sitting there and not focusing to all of a sudden they're like, whoop, we're playing. Well, now you should be raising a whole lot tighter from the cutoff because you're going to get played with and you're going to be out of position, right? It's not where you want to be. So make sure you look to the left. Those are my preflop tips. Stay here though, because I have a gift for you. Let's recap these 10 preflop tips. Number one, think in terms of hand ranges. Do not put people on a specific hand. Number two, make sure you're counting preflop combinations and understand how having a card in your hand removes combinations of potential hands from your opponent's ranges. Number three, start with GTO preflop ranges. Again, so many people think they can do whatever they want before the flop because how bad could it be? Or they think they're going to outplay their opponents or whatever. And unless you have a good reason to be adjusting, don't. Number four, use sound preflop raise sizes. Number five, 
three bet with a polarized range from in position, a linear range from the small blind, and then optimal ranges, which are the best hands plus some suited connected type stuff from the big blind. Number eight, make a point to crush the limpers. Limpers and small stakes games will give you tons of money. Number nine, play tighter in multi-way pots than you may think you should. And number 10, make sure you look to the left. How do you adapt to players on your left who call very, very often? Do we tighten or widen our range? You don't really want to get called by players on your left. That said, if they're calling with junk, just play normal-ish ranges. Um, perhaps you want to fold out the bottom portion of your range if you know you're going to be getting called a lot. The offsuit stuff's going to go down in value because you're going to have to see the flop and therefore you, know, you need to be able to make the nuts more often. But no, just play normally for the most part. I mean, if they're going to be calling with, with trash, that's fine. Just, I mean, you're, you're raising with a linear-ish range to begin with. I have some free gifts for you. It's Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day to all the couples out there. I have five free eBooks for you. You can go get them right now. PokerCoaching.com slash Valentine's. I have 10 tips to master No Limit Hold'em preflop strategy. We just walked through all of these. I have it in eBook form for you. Number two, 10 tips to master post-flop strategy. We discuss how to crush straightforward players on the flop. We talk about not continuation betting every single time. We discuss range advantage, nut advantage, Spots to bluff on the river, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I have another ebook for you. 10 tips to master. Well, 10 tips for bluffing. 10 bluffs to master. Man, my brain's broken. I can't read. I go through 10 different bluffs that I think you need to make sure you add to your arsenal, such as going all in when you're short stacked and over betting on the river. I have another book for you. 10 tips to master poker away from the table. Everyone thinks that, well, a lot of people think that just show up and play good poker and you'll win. There's actually a whole lot of players who are really, really good at poker, but they're bad at life. And if you're bad at life, you're going to get wrecked at poker. And even if you are good at poker and you give away all your money, slash lose your money, whatever, it's not going to work out for you. Then finally, one more gift, maximally exploiting your opponents. I discuss how to exploit the most common types of players you're going to be encountering. Those who play too many hands too passively, too many hands too aggressively, too few hands too passively, and too few hands too aggressively. Go to pokercoaching.com slash valentine right now to get these books. They are all free. Zero dollars. Also, you all been asking me for Pot Limit Omaha content. Well, while I am pretty good at Pot Limit Omaha, I'm not the best. So we hired Adam Hendricks. Adam Hendricks absolutely crushes PLO and No Limit Hold'em, to be fair. But he is a master of Pot Limit Omaha. And we have a PLO series coming exclusively for Poker Coaching Premium members on February 20th. You can get a free sneak peek right now at pokercoaching.com slash PLO. All free stuff for all of you today. You can get the ebooks at pokercoaching.com slash Valentine. No S at the end. Valentine. And you can get a free sync peek of the Master PLO Cash Game Series with Adam Hendricks at pokercoaching.com slash PLO. That's me for today. Short and sweet. Enjoy your day. Make the most of your opportunities. I wish you all the best luck. I hope you all have a wonderful Valentine's Day. And, you know, work hard, study hard, play hard, enjoy yourself, and love life. I'll talk to all of you next time.